Hello. Um, I hope all of you are doing awesome today. It is a beautiful Saturday. The weather is perfect. Um, I pray that you go out and enjoy it. I know Winry and I are about to go outside and enjoy the beautiful weather. Um, fall is upon us. Praise the Lord. Um, ready for some cooler temperatures and just to get outside and have some bonfires and whatever else fall brings to us. Um, so before we get started on our new lesson, we're entering a new week today, a new unit. But before we get started, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for, again, the beautiful weather that you have given us today. God, I thank you for the fact that we are able to experience this beautiful weather today, God, that we were created for such a time as this, not just to enjoy your beautiful weather, God, but to get out into it and let people know that we have a hope that is everlasting, and that's you. And God, I pray that we, we share you today, that our cup would overflow to everybody around us, God, that we would be so confident in who you are that everybody around us would know where we stand in regards to you. So God, as we get ready to start this new unit, God, I pray that you would be with us. I pray that you would be amongst us, God, that we would open our ears and our hearts to what you have for us today. And it's in your name we pray, amen. So, like I said, we're starting a new unit today and it is called Made For It. And this week is called, We Were Made to Be Connected to People Who Are Connected to God. So, first question is, have you ever used something in a way other than the way that it was supposed to be used? Um, I know we can all say yes, I guarantee it. Um, we've all come up with ways hacks life hacks as you if you want to call it that um to help us out in a pinch when we re really needed something but from time to time whether we're honest with ourselves or not we have all improvised and used something in a way that it was not technically designed for and at the same time nearly everything works better when we use it the way that it was designed right that's true of cell phones, it's true of microwaves, cars, forks, spoons, TV, you name it. It always works better when we use it the way that it was designed to be used. We are designed for certain conditions. Food, water, and shelter help, excuse me, they help people function better. And if we don't have enough of these, we start to feel it, right? I know that some of us, when we get super, super hungry, we call it hangry, but we start to feel our body. We all, it's, it almost feels like it's being depleted of something. And when we're, we don't have water and we haven't had water for a while, our body starts to shut down because it feels it because we're designed to thrive off of water and food. Um, and while those things are our more obvious conditions that we are designed for. We were made for so much more than just food, water, and shelter. I know everybody who is watching and listening knows that we were made for more than just that. So in this series, we're, gonna, we're going to be looking at a few of the needs that God has hardwired into every single one of us. We'll discover a few things that make us run better as humans because we're made for it. Now, in addition to oxygen, water, and the occasional sweet, from the very beginning, God designed people to need other people. God designed people to need other people, in, and in the beginning, God created everything. After making the heavens, the earth, the sky, the water, the animals, the flowers, the trees, the author of Genesis reminds us that all of it was good right up until the minute it wasn't. And in Genesis 2.18, this is what it says. The Lord God said, it is not good 
for the man to be alone. Have you ever thought about that one particular verse? In all of the first chapter of Genesis, God made light and he saw that it was good. God made animal and he saw that it was good. God made man and he saw that it was good and so on and so forth. And then we get to this verse and God says, it is not good. This is the first not good thing in creation. And the first not good thing in creation, it wasn't an earthquake. It wasn't a fire or an angry lion or porcupine or what have you. It was being alone. That was the first not good thing in creation, aloneness. And maybe that that may seem kind of dramatic. And after all, there are a lot of worse things than being alone in life. I mean, plenty of people have survived a Friday night by themselves. I mean, I just did. And it was, I love my husband, but it was glorious. Me and Winry had a full on girls night. Um, and then when she went to bed, I just sat and I ate my ice cream and I watched Bones. And I survived a Friday night all by myself. And I know you guys have too, but it's not ideal. While we may enjoy time to ourselves from time to time, we want that to be our choice. We don't want it to be a choice that's made for us. And while we may like some alone time, we weren't made to be alone all of the time. God knew that. He knew that even though, excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, he knew that even though we can survive being on our own, it's not it's not how he designed us to live. It's not what he made us for. We weren't made to do life on our own for long. And when we try, when we try to do life on our own, just like when we try to go out without food, try to go without food or water, we don't function as well as we could or as we should. And here's what I mean. Did you know that insufficient social connection is a bigger risk factor to your health than obesity or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So being alone, social, social isolation is worse for your health than being obese or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Or did you know that loneliness affects the same part of our brain that feels physical pain? So loneliness isn't just something that we feel in our hearts. It is a physical thing that we feel and it hurts. So when we're dis di blah, 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 can't speak. <laughs> so when we're disconnected from people for too long, God has wired our brains and our bodies to let us know, hey, something is wrong. Something is not right here. But the question is why? Why did God hardwire our bodies to let us, to, why did he make us this way? And as we, we go through this, we'll discover today that the need for other people isn't a design flaw. It's not a mistake. It's actually, it's a part of our heavenly design. It's a part of God's original design for us. It's how we were created. To talk about that, we got to go back to the very beginning though. And so God created mankind, and this is in Genesis chapter 1, and this is verse 27. And it says, God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Both male and female, he created them. People, all people were created in the image of God, which means that we have some of his attributes. Part of him is reflected in us. God himself is the picture, the perfect picture of community and connection. I think about it. We have God the Father, Jesus, God the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. And they exist constantly connected and they're constantly in relationship. So wouldn't it make sense that we were created in his image so that so we're designed to live the same way? constantly in relationship, constantly connected to other people who are created in God's image. In other words, we are created 
to be connected to people. And when we live in connection with others, in community with others, we've, uh, sorry, my chair rolled out from underneath me. Um, we are, we're a reflection of the image of God. There are all kinds of community as well. Some of us are living in community or close friendship with people in our group of friends or maybe people at work. And those are great, but we need more than just, we need more than just any old friendship. When life and faith collide, when we go through hard times in parenting or grandparenting, when we, when we have those big questions about life, eternity or faith, we need a specific kind of community, a faith community. And that's one of the reasons that we gather in groups like this. I know it's not a physical group, but most normally it is. But that's why we gather in groups like this each week. And as we get to know each other better, we become more connected. We get to know God better. And that's why simply showing up each week to Sunday school or to church service or to Wednesday night Bible study or women's and men's club. That's why showing up and being a part of the conversation and being real with the group is a significant part, part of our growing faith. We were made to be connected to people who are connected to God. And all throughout history, God's people have discovered more about him in community with each other. But never is this reality clearer than in the earliest days of, after Jesus' resurrection. People who saw the crucifixion live and in person, the brutality of their local government was too real. And that threatened, that threat remained after Jesus' resurrection. It didn't just go away all of a sudden. And some of his followers scattered because everyone was scared. And being a Christian wasn't just unpopular at that time, it was dangerous. Yet they continued. They continued meeting, even in a scary time, small gatherings of believers popped up all over the place. Let's listen to see how Luke, the doctor, the investigator, described it all in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 46. And this is after Jesus' resurrection, when it was a dangerous time to be a believer. So keep that in mind. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were taught, or were together, sorry, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So Luke told us these earliest believers ate together, they prayed together, they talked about their faith together, they looked out for one another, they shared with one another, they attended church together, and they visited each other in their homes. In other words, they lived in a close, connected community with each other. Now, for being honest, for many adults, this kind of friendship feels foreign. And the busyness of life and the isolation of modern times, even finding one, one close friend can feel like a huge challenge. But even if we're not sure that it's possible, something in us longs and desires for this kind of a relationship because we were made to be create connected Sorry, we were made to be connected to people who are connected to God. But there's more at stake than our happiness or fulfill fulfillment. Look what happens in verse 47 as a result of what the, the followers did. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all of the people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
In other words, just by simply being in community with each other, just by being in community, it caught the attention of the whole world around them. They were well liked, they were well respected, and as a result, more people became believers because of their sense of community. Because they, in times of terror, I would almost say, they were terrified. But yet they still continued to do these things. They were scared to go out. They were scared to meet together because of what happened to Jesus and what was threatened to happen to them. They were scared. But yet they still continued. And because of that, because their love for God, their love for community outweighed the scare, more people were added to their numbers every day. More people became believers of Jesus Christ because of their commitment to community in Christ. The same is true for us. Every person around us is made in the image of God, no matter what they believe. So you could be an atheist and guess what? You're still created in the image of God. Black, white, Native American, Irish, Muslim, it doesn't matter. We are all created in the image of Christ, regardless of what our beliefs are, that does not change who we were created in the image of. Something in them, just like us, is drawn to community because we were made for it. Everybody was made for it. When we demonstrate the kind of community that the early church did with each other, and we demonstrate also God's love to people who don't yet believe, We may just find out that they're more willing willing to hear about a God who loves them from people who love him, but also love each other well. And all of this brings up some interesting and albeit uncomfortable questions. Questions like, if there's so much benefit to being in community with other believers, why aren't the churches more filled? Why doesn't Why doesn't church today feel as beneficial to everyone as the early church did? Are we doing it right even? I think there are a number of reasons for that, but one of them is this. Our culture makes it easy to have surface relationships. We've learned how to attend an event, interact politely, have conversations, learn a lot, and then go home to our lives without ever really connecting to the people around us. And in some ways, it's it's easy to treat church like a concert or a sporting event. We're nice to the people sitting in our row. We're not close friends with anybody there. We may cheer for the same team, but we don't actually know enough about the people around us to cheer for each other. Now, there's nothing wrong with being part of a big group of people, nothing at all. It's fun, it's a fun experience. The problem is though, you can't be connected to everyone in a crowd. You can't trust everyone in a crowd. You can't share life with everyone in a crowd. Ultimately, you and I were made to be connected to and to share life with a few people in addition to our families. But in a world that prioritizes emails over conversations or text messages over phone calls and sound bites over discussion, how does anybody actually ever get connected? How does anybody actually learn anything about anybody? Put simply, how do adults find friends? Because if you haven't noticed, kids can find friends pretty easily because my daughter has She's friends with pretty much everybody in her grade because there's no barrier there. They're kids. They don't they don't have the busyness of life. They prioritize the kids that are around them. But how do adults find friends? And especially, how do adults find friends who share their faith? Here are a few ways that maybe we can find friends who share our faith with us. Number one is we can prioritize finding community. Even though we're made for community, true community rarely comes knocking 
at the door. It's something that we have to find. And finding the right people to do life with takes time. It doesn't just happen overnight. Maybe for you, a great place to start, maybe a Sunday school or church. Maybe we are your people, but that also might not be true for you. And if not, it's okay, it's not a bad thing. You were made for connection with people and finding those people is one of the best things that can happen for your faith, whether it's in this group, in this church or not. Number two is to show up consistently. The truth is that connection, real connection is not instant. It doesn't happen the first time that you meet or even the second time. But notice how often the early church saw one another. They saw each other in the temple. They saw each other in their homes, at meals, at services, community events. And every time that they showed up, the relationship became deeper and deeper. The same is true for us. It is difficult, sometimes maybe impossible to find true community once a month or even once a week. It's impossible to find true community that way. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to meet every single night, but it does mean that you may find it helpful to pick one person and intentionally connect with them outside of the group. Shoot them a text, grab coffee after work, find a way to show up for them during the week. Be intentional with showing up. And number three is to lean in. Most of us have a threshold for how real we can be with other people. We know how to interact politely and answer questions without ever really letting other people into our lives. And sometimes in a group like this, when things get a little too real or a little too personal, we lean back and we let somebody else answer or we let somebody else do the discussing. And that's natural, but it doesn't help us find real connection. In order to connect with those around us, truly connect with those around us, we need to let someone or a group of someones know the real us, not just the the polished public church version of us. And maybe that means that you commit to leaning in instead of leaning back when things get personal in a conversation. Maybe it means that you agree to hear a policy of confidentiality, or maybe it means here that you agree here to a policy of confidentiality so that everyone is comfortable opening up. The point is this, that when one person decides to be real in a group, it becomes easier for everybody else to do the same, and it allows true community to develop. I know for a lot of us, it all, all of this sounds good <laughs> and it sounds like a lot of work and it sounds like a lot of time and a lot of putting ourselves out there, which more often than not probably isn't comfortable for some of us, but that it's just life. But imagine if we did it, imagine if we spent the time and we put ourselves out there. Imagine if we did that. Imagine if the church and believers became known for something other than our positions. What if when people talked about us, they didn't talk about what we're against, but instead they were fascinated by how we are so for each other. Imagine it wouldn't only, I'm, it wouldn't only change how people see believers, but it would change how they see Christ inevitably. It would change our own lives as well. We need community. We need connection. We were made for connection. And I think the fact that if we loved each other well and we took time to connect to each other on a real level, I think the fact that that by effect would cause other people to view Christ in a different way, not just us, but that they would view Christ in a different way because they see how well we love each other 
and how connected we are. I think that outweighs any disagreements or any personal beliefs that, that don't align. Because if we believe in Jesus Christ, that's what matters. That God sent his one and only son to die on the cross so that we may have eternal life with him if we believe. That is what matters. And if people can see us in community loving each other, cheering for each other, having each other's backs and being open and honest with one another, and they see that and are led to Christ through that, being vulnerable, being open, putting ourselves out there is all worth it, even if one person gets saved from community. And so before I pray us out, I have one question that I really want all of us, not just you guys, but myself included, I want all of us to really think about and really answer. I don't, I don't, we don't need surface level answers. We don't need, uh, we don't need any of that. We need heartfelt answers answers that we really thought about, putting our own differences aside, putting, putting our own fears aside. We need to really think about this question and find out where the church is today. So my question for you is this. First, I want you to read Acts. It, we've already, we already kind of talked about it, um, but I want you to read Acts chapter two, verses 42 through 47. And it's about the early church and what they did when life got scary and there was a lot for them to be afraid of. But those few verses, those five, six verses talk about what the church did in face of fear. And I want you to think about these verses of being all together. I want you to think about them during COVID. And I want you to think, what do you think that the church should look like today in light of this passage what do you think the church should look like today in light of scary times in light of fear what do you think we should look like today and again really think about it pray about it don't just hear the question and and give me give the first answer off the top of your head meditate on the scripture meditate on the question pray and find out where God, what God thinks the church should look like today in light of this passage during COVID. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for this lesson. God, I thank you for community that we all desire. It's a, it's a hardwired condition of the human heart, God to long for people who share our faith. And God, we were made for it, just like everybody else was made for it. God, I pray these two things specifically today. One is that just like in Genesis, God, everybody was created in your image. And I pray that we would see that, God. It doesn't matter what somebody else believes. They are still created in the image of Christ and we are to treat them as such, regardless of ethnic backgrounds and beliefs, God. First and foremost, they are created in your image. And the second thing, God, is I wanna pray about what the church looks like today in the face of fear and scary times and unknown times. God, I pray that we would be like the church in Acts, that we wouldn't use a fearful time to, to shut up and hide, but God, that we would use a fearful time to, to learn how to be in true community with each other. God, that we wouldn't back down, that we would buckle down and we would be together in a real community, God, and that we would cast our fears aside and cast them onto your feet at the foot of the cross. That we wouldn't let fear rule our lives because God, a big thing is happening 
And if we can buckle down and move forward and meet together and have community with each other, real community with each other, God, I know people will get saved. They'll see the church in the light of uncertain times, getting together, being together, remaining together, being strong together. And they'll see Christ in a different way because we love each other well. And God, I pray for that right now. I pray that one person would see community in the church. At least one person, God, would come to know you through community in the church of believers. And God, I pray that Parkersburg Salvation Army, that we would meet together with no fear in the hopes of building your kingdom and it is in your name that we pray. Amen. I hope everybody has a fantastic weekend. Enjoy the weather. Um, some of you I'll see tomorrow morning, bright and early, 1045 for church. I hope you're all there. Um, God's going to move in a big way tomorrow. He's going to move in a big way today. He already has. So don't let fear hold you down. Get out, get up, get moving. Because the kingdom of God waits for no one. Love you guys.